Thank you so much. Um, it's always good to be reminded of what one promised to do. Um, and the, the, the abstract is always promissory. So we'll see, um, we'll see if we get there. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and get started. Um, we will view the slideshow here um, so you can't see my notes. Uh, is everything sounding good and, and looking as it should? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak in, in this uh, series. Um, I found it uh, both interesting and, and inspiring as well um, to think about how um, perhaps the talk that I'm going to give fits into all of your categories, um, uh, both modeling and mark making, but also certainly aftermath. Um, so perhaps we can we can talk about um, the nice resonance between between those categories and and this content um, uh, when when I'm done. Okay, so I thought I would start um, by uh, telling you a little bit about how I came to think about antioxidants. And it actually was through um, uh, the work of my friends uh, and colleagues here, uh, uh, an artist duo known as the Cooking Sections, um, who recently were uh, nominated for the Turner Prize in the UK, and are place-based artists uh, with one project on the Isle of Skye, which is an artistic, um, and ethical intervention into salmon farming. And they asked me to write an introduction to their wonderful little book uh, that you see here on the screen um, called Salmon, a Red Herring, which accompanied their uh, 2021 show of the, that name at the Tate in London. So in their um, playful, uh, but rather devastating critique of commercial salmon farming, one thing that these artists point to is the role of this molecule with a wonderful name, astaxanthin, in keeping the whole system going. Astaxanthin is a totally fascinating molecule and, and not only if you're a chemistry geek, it's fascinating for everybody. Um, in nature, uh, such as we still have it, it is made uh, by algal cells um, here on the top. Uh, when algae are exposed to uh, environmental stressors, such as increased UV from sunlight, they manufacture this molecule. And the little tiny shrimp-like creatures, krill, eat the algae, and the salmon eat the krill. And this food chain results in salmon, uh, the insides of salmon being pink. So farmed salmon in ocean pens would actually be gray, if uh, they were not fed astaxanthin, um, because salmon uh, it, who are farmed are not, are not out there in the oceans eating their natural foods. So astaxanthin, that pile of red pigment that you see there on the screen, um, is either made uh, by farming algae, those are the tubes that you see there um, on the screen, or uh, it is made uh, directly by cracking petroleum. You can put petroleum under high heat and crack it into long hydrocarbon chains and reconstitute it uh, to make this molecule. Okay, so this is about more than just the aesthetics of a salmon filet in the supermarket or on a restaurant plate. Of course, uh, consumers would be unlikely to buy salmon if it was gray. Uh, it's so closely associated with the color pink that astaxanthin is a really important part of making it the commodity it is. But it's about so much more than that. Astaxanthin is actually this kind of crazy molecule. It's a huge string of 40 carbons with multiple bonds between them. And algae put a lot of energy and really valuable materials into making these pigments because pigments are chemical compounds that reflect only certain wavelengths of light and absorb others. Of course, algae are autotrophs. They make their own food using photosynthesis. So they need to absorb the light to get the energy to make glucose. So algae have to capture light energy and sometimes they're exposed to more light than photosynthesis can process or this process of making glucose with light energy throws off 
all kinds of unstable molecules that cause chain reactions that can damage membrane proteins or DNA in the, in the algal cell. So the algae makes this molecule to protect itself, to absorb light and to uh, be a metabolic being without breaking apart under the sort of uh, forces and, and um, damaging reactivity that, that metabolism can bring. So astaxanthin is highly protective to algal cells against free radicals generated by UV or metabolic stress. And the krill and the salmon that take up this handy molecule through their diet, they sort of take it up ready-made and they use it in the same way as, as well. So astaxanthin doesn't just make salmon pink, it's actually fundamental to their reproduction and growth and to protecting them against the high stress conditions of aquaculture. Astaxanthin thus illustrates the concept of the antioxidant nicely at a couple of levels. First is this chemical definition. And I, I, I apologize for giving you like chemistry class uh, diagrams, but I promise we're gonna get them out of the way and, and move on to, um, to, to, to less chemistry class-like things. But we need to understand this chemical definition and the kind of role of these molecules to unfold the rest of the story, the social story, the economic story. So in both of these diagrams, there, there are two versions of the same thing, basically. Um, you see a generic molecule depicted as a free radical. And a free radical is reactive and unstable because it has an unpaired electron. So these are called oxidants because they tend to rob um, other atoms of an electron, leaving them with an unbalanced balanced number of electrons and therefore in a state of high reactivity. So this can create a chain reaction in whatever substance a free radical is in, whether it's a living cell or something like a bottle of fish oil. One electron lacking reactive molecule steals an electron from the next one and so on, um, breaking the carbon chains of fat molecules and forming reactive ring structures from the broken bits. Antioxidants are these substances uh, that can donate an electron without themselves becoming destabilized. I told you astaxanthin is this huge, crazy molecule. It, it's like a buffer, it's like a cushion. It can give up an electron and still stay stable. So antioxidants such as astaxanthin halt these chain reactions. They inhibit the development of rancidity in oily substances, and they protect living cells from uh, molecular damage. So the second way that astaxanthin is a nice illustration of um, a much broader principle that I want to talk about um, today is that, that it really shows us um, how humans have gone about not just knowing about metabolism and making nice chemistry diagrams, but industrializing it. The history I'm about to unfold for you shows that humans have built a huge amount of knowledge about metabolism, the set of interlinked processes by which nutrients, energy, oxygen, and toxicants are moved around, used, and excreted by living things. Using this knowledge of metabolisms, humans have picked out many metabolically powerful objects and processes such as astaxanthin's free radical squelching capacities and magnified these capacities by mass producing the molecules. In this case, either by harvesting it from yeast or algae or krill, or by using the synthetic chemistry uh, that, I, that I talked about uh, to build the molecule. Either way, we get a picking out of a particular metabolic power and a real scaling up of it. So if by industrialization, we mean the development of industries in a country or a region on a wide scale, then in this example, we see the industrialization of metabolism, the development of high volume manufacturing and mechanization 
of a previously biological process or substance, and then its redeployment in an anthropogenic resource production web. And it is redeployed at scales, at speeds uh, that it never possessed uh, in uh, its natural state. So astaxanthin is a nice example of the industrialization of metabolism, which indeed the story of antioxidants is an essential part of. So as I noted, astaxanthin enables salmon farming and all the logics of doing things like feeding uh, soy crops to fish. If we didn't add the astaxanthin, uh, there would be all kinds of uh, 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 echo effects from there. The industrial mobilization of the antioxidant is in the service of several forms of temporal control, keeping the fish feed from oxidizing and exploding in transit, keeping the fish growing and reproducing long enough to become food, and enhancing the character of the harvested flesh or eggs as human food. So antioxidants help things last long enough to be consumed. Astaxanthin is a good example through which to make this third point about why antioxidants are important to understand. The industrialization of metabolism means not just a change in scale, or the commoditization of previously ignored molecules from previously non-domesticated creatures such as algae and krill, but it also means the provision of an industrial temporal architecture for how things and bodies live in time. Oops. Fourth and last, I want to draw attention to the fact that antioxidants are not just infrastructural to the deranged food webs that constitute our contemporary condition. They are also then mass produced for sale back to populations suffering from metabolic disorders and pollution stress engendered by those very conditions. As Anthony Ryan Hatch has observed in his work on blood sugar, the burden of metabolic disease creates demand for for-profit health services that palliate, but do not treat the root causes of chronic illnesses. I just wanna note here that, that this particular product um, uh, is, is marketed by Professor Eco, uh, which uh, is a, a funny denomination. Of course, um, you can go a long way uh, with this, uh, uh, this marketing. Here's an example of, of, some, of one piece of marketing that went just uh, a little bit too far. So it, it is with all of this in mind that I set out to understand the antioxidant. I started in the present with astaxanthin and, and asked the question, what is an antioxidant? Where does this concept come from? Where did we get it from? What do we do with it? So you might think from this setup that this talk is going to be in the form of an expose, that I'm going to reveal antioxidants for what they really are, tiny little weak things projecting a big false marketing narrative, such as this one, or that I'm going to reveal yet another terrible toxicity narrative about food ingredients that are secretly poisoning us. I do admit that both of these approaches are possible, but what I wanna do here in the time remaining is to think really seriously about what antioxidants are as objects of knowledge, as industrial technologies, and as economic, cultural, and historical forces, exactly because they represent the human taking into hand of metabolic power exactly because they are about so much more than just food, but about systems of metabolic power and its distribution. I would like to say that antioxidants are not good for us and they're not bad for us as much as they might be us to the extent that we are creatures of our times and creatures of the biochemical metabolic world that the 20th century has built us into. So by the time I finish today, 
I hope that your thinking has shifted away from these things as perhaps vaguely funny artifacts of rampant gaslighting health capitalism to understanding antioxidants as fundamental technologies in restructuring uh, the world. Okay, so that is how I got to this topic, but of course, I'm a historian and a sociologist. I like to fold the present up against the past and um, always ask where these things come from. Now I gave you chemistry diagrams, but I wanna say that these topics are as much questions of philosophy as they are questions of eating. They are as much questions of concepts as they are those of material objects. So I wanted to start this history actually with Henri Bergson and the idea that the history of metabolism and its technical manipulation is in some ways a long history of the control and manipulation of explosivity. So in 1911 in Creative Evolution, the philosopher Henri Bergson described the food of animals as made of very complex molecules holding a considerable amount of chemical energy in the potential state, and that they are like explosives which only need a spark to set free the energy stored within in them. On the one hand, this is a physiological statement narrated through Bergson's understanding of the role of uh, animal glycogen as a form of chemical storage of sugars in the liver for release later to ensure a steady glucose supply to all the tissues. On the other hand, this is a rumination on the nature of the organism as an explosive accumulation. And it serves an important role in Bergson's overall characterization of vital activity as a kind of coming together of the capacity to fall apart, a reality which is making itself in a reality which is unmaking itself. Now, as I said, this is a matter of philosophy, but it is also a matter of extreme practicality. In fact, we can see, we can draw this thread of explosivity and its control through the very history of capitalism and industrialization. The founder of organic chemistry observed uh, in 1827 that there was a fundamental property of some oils that they seem to take up oxygen uh, slowly at first and then very rapidly. And he saw this in the laboratory and wrote about this property and said, corresponding to what we see in the laboratory of oils taking up oxygen. We have a corresponding example in which elevated, in the elevated temperature which develops when wool is lubricated with linseed oil. If left in a heap, it often ignites itself and in that matter, it has destroyed many textile mills. Surely such a rapid absorption of oxygen is the cause of the elevated temperature. So oxidation, this, uh, which at first was understood as the absorption of oxygen was a chemical problem and a practical problem. Uh, people used uh, oil to lubricate wool so it could be carded and turned into, into fabrics. And even well into the 20th century, um, people had a hard time getting insurance for their, their mills. And, and the insurance companies would even say which oils they were allowed to use because of the risk of of, of explosions. At the same time, the problem of oxidation was not just one of textile production and fires, but a slower form of destruction. The question of why fats and oils went rancid, particularly when exposed to heat or light. Uh, in this image here, you see um, uh, a kind of send up of the, of the late 19th century practice of making margarine using uh, waste fats. And the, the uh, logo there says bogus butter making, the processes of manufacture, a fat collecting wagon with its unsavory load on its way to the factory. And you see everyone holding their noses. So that is the definition of rancidity, rancidus uh, from the Latin stinking. 
And this question of why fats went rancid, particularly when exposed to heat or light, was like explosivity, something that was of profound commercial importance, but also of great uh, chemical mystery. There was, uh, in this long history of what in the 19th century was called animal and vegetable chem chemistry, a dedicated effort toward trying to sort out why fats and important foodstuffs like butter and cheese and food oils went rancid, and also uh, why substances such as gallic acid extracted from tree galls, you see those round, round growths um, uh, inspired by the gall wasp, wasp, you could extract gallic acid from the tree galls and add a little bit of it to fats and, they, and, and it would halt the processes of rancidity. Beyond uh, extracting one thing and applying it to the other though, this remained quite mysterious as a phenomenon until um, World War I. So chemists didn't understand either explosions or rancidity until the 20th century and perhaps in the unexpected context of gas warfare. Historian of chemistry Michael Fremantle writes that the escalating use of gas warfare in World War I sparked off a furious research effort to find tear gas to put in grenades and artil artillery shells that could be made from components that weren't too expensive or in short supply. So this um, clear, uh, colorless, simple aldehyde called acrolyne could be made from glycerol, which was a common component of soaps but it had the distinct disadvantage that it was really highly reactive with oxygen. As soon it was, as it was exposed to oxygen, the gas would turn to a sticky brown residue and wouldn't be, um, would, couldn't be released as a gas, um, couldn't be used as a tear gas. The French chemists Charles Moreau and Charles Dufres discovered that the addition of hydroquinone, a derivative of benzene in very, very small quantities would keep the acrolyne liquid and stable. And they observed that in the presence of one part hydroquinone in 10,000, acrolyne remained absolutely transparent and unaltered, whereas a control sample too soon became opaque and changed to an inert mass of uh, this acryl. So the problem of the stabilization of acrolyne was solved with this tiny addition of hydroquinone. Hydroquinone seemed to stop the chain reaction that turned the, the colorless liquid into the sticky resin. And they wrote that this problem of the stabilization of acrolyne was thereby solved and it was possible to manufacture this substance in large quantities. They heralded the fact that in one factory, it was possible to produce 1,000 of kilograms of acrolyne a day, whereas the greatest quantity that it had been possible to make before uh, was very small and only at laboratory scale. Hydroquinone, as you no doubt have guessed by now, uh, is what came to be called an antioxidant and was key to the understanding that some substances added in very small quantities could halt this chain reaction of electron stealing, basically. And Moreau and Dufresne came up with what they called a theory of uh, antioxygenic and pro-oxygenic activity. Just as a side note, acrolyne uh, after the war went on to a different kind of uh, life in uh, the reconstruction of food systems. Um, what you see here is that acrolyne is an intermediate pro product in the um, making of the amino acid methionine uh, from oil. And so uh, again, this is a way in which the constituents of the sort of uh, key nutrients of animal agriculture uh, came to be made uh, directly from oil. This is a bit of a side note. It's another thing that I, that I work on, but it does show this kind of continuity between oil and food that we might not uh, expect to be so, so direct. And again, this just wouldn't be possible as a, a work of mass production if in the absence of this antioxidant stabilization of these materials.
So Moreau and Dufres published this work on hydroquinone and acrolein, accompanied by their theory of antioxidant action in 1922 in French. And a few years later, it was widely translated as well as widely cited in part, not because it was about acrolein and tear gas, but because it was a theory of explosivity and its halting, of rancidity and its halting. There was such widespread interest in halting these processes of oxidation in the rubber and oil industries, but also in the growing field of food technology. And here we find a really interesting intersection between these synthetic processes and these industries around uh, rubber and oil commodities and questions of basic nutrients. Also in 1922, Herbert Evans and Catherine Bishop, funded by the California Central Creameries and the Committee for Research on Sex Problems of the National Research Council, investigated reports that there might be a vitamin other than the A, B, C, and D, which had been discovered uh, uh, to date. They gave uh, experimental animals, rats, a carefully composed diet with known vitamins and lard, purified protein and starch. And what they found was that under this dietary regime, animals, um, uh, female animals conceived but resorbed uh, the fetuses uh, before giving birth and male animals experienced atrophy of uh, the tissues that generate sperm. Fertility could be rescued simply by feeding the animals lettuce leaves. That was the only thing they needed to add to restore fertility to the animals. However, this mysterious factor X was very confusing. Uh, and, and it took about 10 years um, and much detail that I'm not going to tell you to figure out that vitamin E, like hydroquinone, was an antioxidant. Henry Maddell, shown here on the right, turned directly to the work on acroline to understand vitamin E. He concluded that vitamin E was antioxidant, and there was an electronic explanation, as he put it, for its paradoxical ability to both prevent rancidity, but also to be destroyed in foods if the rancidity had already started. In the wake of this uh, discovery that vitamin E was um, a uh, antioxidant in its own right. Um, it became one of the first uh, uh, widely marketed uh, commodities. While there was avid interest in the question of what vitamin E given directly to people might do with unfortunately generally disappointing results, perhaps the more profound impact came from its immediate uptake into the practice of using some oils to protect others. The idea that small amounts of inhibitors added to bulk supplies could prevent them from going rancid um, was extremely exciting and led to a flourishing of all kinds of extracts, of adding powdered oats to ice cream, of adding extracts of uh, tropical trees to, to other oils. It wasn't even necessarily a new idea. Um, as I told you before, longstanding empirical experience had shown that some plant extracts could protect other foods for, for periods of time. But this category, this word, this object, this patentable thing of the antioxidant gave it a new technological status. So, thus things such as soy lecithin, lecithin and wheat germ oil were added in small quantities to keep human foods and oils fresh, but also added to animal feeds. These were natural extracts, but chemists soon learned to make vitamins A and E, as well as beta carotene, uh, directly from things like acetylene, which of course was also the source of things like plastics. There's this kind of formation of a strange petro-animal continuity in this period. It was conceptually and practically a continuum between the substances that one could make with oil, the things that were being understood in animal physiology and the kind of traffic back and forth 
uh, bec between these domains. Vitamin E could be chemically synthesized from oil, um, as in this ad from Shell uh, Industrial uh, Lubrication. Here from an oil well was one of the mysterious forces contributing to the production of life itself. Of course, they were referring to vitamin E as the fertility vitamin, as it was understood in this period. But there was this just uh, back and forth uh, going on in this period between, uh, between oil and food. Of course, a huge push for te these technologies of duration came from the food industries. A great deal of research activity on antioxidants occurred in the laboratories of the meat industry. Here we see uh, the packing company, Swift and Company. They were meat packers, but they also ran research laboratories. This was in large part because the growing industry depended on its products keeping for long enough to be transported along growing uh, transport chains to consumers. The meat itself, but also the waste products, such as uh, what you got when you rendered carcasses, such as lard. So Swift and Company's research laboratory was central to the patenting of uh, some of the first pat of some of the first antioxidants derived from plants, such as gum guiac extracted from tropical trees native to the Caribbean and coastal South America, as well as vitamin E. Um, vitamin E and gum guiac quickly became part of food com commodities, but also wrappers and um, uh, was uh, very much a part of the economy of lard in this period. As historian Ai Hazano has emphasized in her wonderful work on visualizing taste, the growth of the supermarket and the introduction of transparent packaging such as cellophane meant that things had to look fresh to the consumer. Antioxidants, because they hinder oxidation, thus were not just about pre preventing rancidity, but maintaining um, color. World War II, like World War I, intensified these questions of making things last over long distances through supply chains. So here you see a quote from Walter Lundberg of the Hormel Institute reflecting after the war uh, on, on all of the ways in which the problems of rancidity were heightened by, um, by World War II. Food supply, uncertain supply chains, uncertain temporalities. This missive from the National Cotton Council of America, for example, touted the benefits of using an antioxidant derived from cotton. Here's a, a little bit of a close up uh, that, that uh, again, soy left, uh, so not the, the kind of antioxidants that could be uh, derived from cottonseed oil could be added to butter um, to keep it fresh, even in the desert, even after months had uh, elapsed. A lot of wartime funding went directly from the federal government into places like the Swift and Co Laboratories or here the American Meat Institute, a research and lobbying enterprise funded by um, funded by contributions from meat pro producers and meat packers. The American Meat Institute was deeply invested in these questions before the war and research in their laboratories accelerated with um, this government funding in the search for new and better antioxidants. What we see then is this enormous acceleration. 600 antioxidants were patented between 1944 and 1954. Many of them were extracts from plants, um, even though they have these long chemical names like Norcon and Dendron. Um, I'm not sure I would want an antioxidant made from hemlock, but uh, there, there you have it and many other things, uh, it, even down to extracts of rosemary and sage had antioxidant properties. The problem that these scientists identified with these so-called natural antioxidants were that they did not show carry through. And what they meant by carry through was um, that it would carry through perhaps even from the animal body into the lard that was made from the animal into the crackers that were made from the lard. So uh, in their terms, the term carry through is used to denote the effect of the antioxidant in retarding development of rancidity in foods made with fat, such as, for example, pastry, crackers, and potato chips. 
Thus, the antioxidant should ideally reach through several generations of commodity lifetimes, survive the time of lard into the time of crackers. Or as in ensuing experiments on animals, an antioxidant fed to a live organism should survive slaughter in the fat depots and meat of that animal and give these post-mortem products a longer time in the world before rancidity set in. And this is how we get the transfer of synthetic antioxidants first used in uh, the rubber and oil industry into the food um, uh, sector. Extensive tests were in this context run on synthetic antioxidants uh, for suitability in the domain of feeds and foods. And as I've shown you, there was already a great deal of continuity in this conceptual space between meat, oil, plants, and rubber. There was, to these scientists' mind, no reason why you wouldn't explore this space uh, in order to work on food. In 1945, the American Meat Industry's Director of Scientific Research, H.R. Craybill, and his colleague, L.R. Dugan, lit on butylated hydroxyanisole, or BHA, and um, butylated hydroxytoluene, BHT, as possessing this valued and elusive character of carry-through, missing from natural antioxidant action and not possessing undue toxicity. To this very day, BHEA and BHT are fairly ubiquitous, and here you can see that carry-through uh, is an important um, character of their action. Perhaps more significant for thinking about the industrialization of metabolism than use in human food was the impact of these natural and synthetic antioxidants on the composition of animal feed, the, 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 the food of our food. This period during and just after World War II was a time of enormous transformation in the manufactured feed industry. The business of supplying animals raised for food, hide and fur with pre-mixed designed rations. So here you see an advertisement um, uh, showing the scientist coming to the farmer with a scientifically composed feedback on his shoulder. The United States in the 1950s also faced a really paradoxical problem. They had a glut of cheap animal fat. This was because of the rapid rise of synthetic detergents, surfactants, and emulsifiers that were made from petroleum, accelerated by, by government support of the chemical industries. But this meant that the traditional outlet for low-grade animal fat byproducts, namely soap, totally collapsed. An analysis of the 1958 crop year yielded the estimate that 2.75 billion pounds of fat, animal fat, unsuitable for human consumption, were produced as byproducts of carcass rendering, 1 billion pounds in excess of domestic demand. Markets for Greece and tallow in Europe were fairly robust, but it couldn't get over the ocean there was too much time for interaction with oxygen. The resulting rancidity, of course, was unpleasant, unpalatable, or downright poisonous. The solution was antioxidants and feeding that fat back to uh, animals. So poultry rations were selected, quote, because they offered the greatest potential outlet for fats, unquote given that domestic sales of poultry feed had surpassed 30 million tons a year, meaning that, quote, the addition of even 2% of fat to all poultry feeds would require 1.2 billion pounds or more um, than one third of our total inedible fat production, unquote. So there were all kinds of technical problems, such as questions of how to mix the fats into feed, the upper limits of inclusion in relation to palatability and transformation of the, the, of the resulting animals. But addition of fats to feeds had previously been avoided exactly because of rancidity. Rancidity was the biggest problem why this hadn't been used before. But now there were these additional motivations. Evolving methods of solvent extraction of plant oils meant that the oil content of the seed meals 
constituting the bulk of modern animal feeds had recently dropped from 5% to 1%, yielding lower energy, unpalatable and dusty feedstuffs. Why not replace these high value plant oils with high energy, low cost waste animal fats? The rock bottom prices for grease and tallow and the need to do something with the glut meant a concerted push to develop means for overcoming these rancidity problems. And so the answer was this new generation of synthetic antioxidants. First developed in the rubber and oil industries decades earlier for controlling degradation and explosiveness. And of course, uh, the, the synthetic mimics of vitamin E and beta carotene. So this became the structure of the modern animal feed industry. The result is a restructuring of the economy of fat. These more valuable plant oils were stripped from cottonseed and linseed and replaced with cheaper tallow and animal fat, creating a novel metabolic circulation of fats through foods, through feeds, through animals, through plants, through humans. Another result of this history that I've unfolded for you is that people began to rethink fats in the body, not just fats in the feed of chickens, not just fats in the transport of oil. In 1950, we see, in the 1950s, we see the formation of these theories of aging, this question of whether free radicals in the body were causing harm to membranes and fats, and whether, of course, antioxidants then might be an answer for humans to the damage done by radiation or uh, aging. It wasn't a great distance to go to ask what the function of things like vitamin E were in the organisms that contained them and what potentials there were for using natural and synthetic antioxidants as therapeutics or even lifespan enhancers. Particularly in the context of post-war concern about nuclear war, the idea that radiation injury was caused by the production of reaction oxygen species in affected cells and that antioxidants could be ingestible protective agents against this threat was uh, absolutely appealing. However, it didn't work out so well, and we still live in an age of the antioxidant paradox. It seemed a good thing that you could feed uh, people uh, or animals lots and lots of things like vitamin E, but unfortunately, um, it seems like oversupplementation has some unwarranted um, and, and untoward effects. So I won't say too much about it, but um, uh, the idea that antioxidants are good and will solve all of our problems of, of aging um, and so on uh, didn't really turn out that way and actually are incredibly complicated. And this is in part because uh, animals, uh, plants, microbes, they all have these sophisticated economies of oxidation and antioxidants themselves. And so when you layer on top of it, this um, constructed economy of antioxidants, you don't get quite the expected uh, results. Okay. So there is, of course, a great deal more to say about these topics. I've shown you a bit of the history of how something like astaxanthin becomes possible as a technical, cultural, and health object. And there are some further insights that I think uh, we can draw from this story. The antioxidant comes into existence in the 1920s as a conceptual and technical object for making things last long enough to be used in killing. It's part of the long biological and scientific history of metabolism as the containment of explosivity and rancidity. The antioxidant as we now know it has arisen in a kind of petro-animal body, a space of material and conceptual continuity between materials derived from oil and gas and materials derived from plants, microbes, and animals. As I said before, antioxidants are neither good for us nor bad for us. 
they have because they are so infrastructural to these systems, to this uh, industrialized food wealth that we have built, they are indeed constituting us. Indeed, I told you this wasn't gonna be a story about unveiling the truth of, or a story of hidden toxicity. It's more a story about what you see when you ask the basic question of our anthropogenic biological present. And that is the question of how on earth did we get here? So what I've given you today is a small piece of a much larger project, which I call American metabolism. And it really is this question, how did we get here? How did we get to a paradoxical time in which epidemiologists list dietary factors at the top of risk factors for morbidity and mortality, that which ostensibly is meant to keep us alive is also at the top of the list of risk factors for metabolic disorders. How did we get to these paradoxical uh, conditions of metabolic disorder? So tracing metabolism as a 19th century concept of the industrial era that becomes a work object in the 20th century, that is an object of engineering, an object of augmentation and diminishment and reorganization that then is uh, fundamental to the rearrangements that are manifesting as the 21st century metabolic condition. That's the kind of background uh, to the history that I've just unfolded for you. So I hope indeed that you've come to think of the antioxidant as a puzzling um, uh, and interesting economic, cultural and technological object. Um, it is indeed uh, constitutive of our current time. So that's the end. And with, I'll end with this image, um, which I took from the local supermarket. Uh, I, it's, speaks to me because it is an image of food uh, suffering under its own weight, uh, which is, uh, I think, a feature of these strange times that we live in. <laughs>